Well, I want to welcome you to the second part of a conversation that we're having here with the Hope Network on leading in times of crisis. Now, if you did not watch or listen to the first part of our conversation on leading yourself in times of crisis, I highly recommend that you click in the description below and go back to part one so that you can hear what we had to say. I'm here with two very special guests. We gave them the full big uh, introduction in part one, but we're going to shorten that and get right down to it in part two. I'm here with Pastor Matthew Hartsville from Bay Hope Church, Pastor George Isvito from Grace Church down in Cape Coral. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here uh, with us sure. for this conversation. Now, we're going to kind of, like I said, we're going to kind of uh, move from leading ourselves. We had a great conversation, and you guys had amazing input for us for leading ourselves in times of crisis, and we're going to move that to how do we then go about leading organizations and churches in times of crisis? Now, I don't know if you've heard this. Have you heard uh, this, uh, this VUCA or, or, or VACA uh, acronym here? It says it's the idea that we're living in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous time here in 2020. Woohoo! You know, like what, what a time to be a leader in the world. But uh, so we're all leading in this, in this VUCA world at this point. How do we do that? How do we go about uh, leading? How has your leadership changed or how has the, the leadership that you brought into it, how has that guided you in the past six months or are there major things that you've had to change? Uh, you know, well, I'll let either one of you kind of sure. jump off of that. that. Well, uh, you know, talking about living in a, in a VUCA world, mm -hmm. as you shared in part one of this, you know, we've always been in crisis before 2020. It's just been the crisis du jour of that year <laughs> or that season sure. of life and ministry. Well, what, what some people may not be aware of is that that particular acronym, VUCA, V-U-C-A, uh, it was actually coined back in 1987 by the uh, U.S. Army War mm -hmm. College. <laughs> and Warren Bennis and Burton Annis did the original research on it. And it was coined by them because that was when the Iron Curtain fell, the Soviet Union collapsed, and all of a sudden, everything that they had operated on uh, for oh. war planning and strategy and operational procedures had completely shifted. It was out the window. And from that point on, it was all volatile. It was all uncertain. <laughs> you know, sure. It was all complex and ambiguous. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and that was back in 87. So if that was true in 87 for our world, how much more so in 2020? So mm -hmm. uh, we always need to operate on somewhat of a crisis footing when we're leading our organizations. Gotcha. And I, I think that when there is a particular focal point of crisis going on that is more global and pandemic like we're facing a lot of right now, I, I think we're served well by that old phrase and what is it, uh, never waste a crisis. Never waste. <laughs> yeah, never waste a crisis. Yeah. Uh, because you can either be, as I said in the first one, you know, stuck or stalled or stunned mm -hmm. Or you can say, all right, what does this now allow me to do that I didn't have an opportunity to do before? Mm -hmm. What does this put us in a position to experience or achieve or try or experiment with for the first time mm -hmm. that we were just lazy about mm -hmm. before? So, I mean, I would just start off this conversation by saying, be proactive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and treat a crisis in a, I mean, obviously recognize it, sure. be real about it, read mm -hmm. the room, okay, but use it as a positive opportunity. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I, th I think, the, uh, like I said in, in part one, what you do during days of peace and serenity will carry you during days of conflict and chaos. Mm -hmm. I think the difficulty is that for many of us as church leaders, is that we reach into into our leadership bag yeah. and it's empty because we haven't been doing the prep work mm -hmm. for, for the crisis that we need to not mm -hmm. waste. Mm -hmm. and, and so again, once the best time to plant a tree, the old Chinese <laughs> proverb right. says 20 years ago, when's or, the second best time? Mm -hmm. Today. Today. <laughs> so, so I would say a second counterintuitive kind of impulse that we need to be tap into. Mm -hmm. And it, again, it's counterintuitive to leaders is to think we, not think I, mm. um, mm -hmm. because there's genius in community. Uh, the triune God lives in community, mm -hmm. and so we need to live in community. The, the, the triune God's strategy for redeeming the creation was to send Jesus to form a team. Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, we need to follow the pattern of the master. And I think that in times of, of, of crisis, uh, to navigate uh, all of that, it, it really is time mm -hmm. to double down mm -hmm. on team and all that it takes to build healthy and holy teams. Right. Now, I think the difficulty between leading in the church, the difference between leading in the church and leading in other marketplace endeavors mm -hmm. is that the church tends to be the place of consistency for many people. Mm -hmm. Then in a whirlwind of life that mm -hmm. I can count on Bay Hope Church Sunday <laughs> morning at 9.30 and yes. 11 o'clock. But I think the unique challenge of the coronavirus is that that got blown out of the water. Mm -hmm. Or as we said mm -hmm. in, in our environment, very different here, in our environment at Grace Church, we said overnight we had to go from a ministry that was primarily an in-person ministry with an online presence. Mm -hmm. And in like two days, for most of us, uh, we <laughs> went to mm -hmm. no in-person ministry and a completely online mm -hmm. ministry. Um, so for us, our online presence meant we were live and we turned on the camera. Right, mm -hmm. sure. And said, hey, just watch if you want. Now all of a sudden it became the venue. And so I think it's a unique sure. challenge for teams who do adaptive work to try to figure out what's the solution overnight yeah. to go to that. You guys were already laying track, mm -hmm. as I said in the first one. And so I think that's why so many of us have looked to Bay Hope Church to help us in, 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 in that work. Well, I'll, I'll echo because as you've modeled so well at, at Grace Church and we preach a lot about it here, we have banned heroic solo leadership. <laughs> yes. It's not the Moses coming down from the summit with the tablets and, right. you know, uh, it is team, team and team. And mm -hmm. as an example of that, the, the weekend when everything shut down, that was what, Sunday, March 15th, right. I, I believe it yeah. was. Well, mm -hmm. I was actually up in Atlanta yeah. that weekend. Pastor Andy Major, our digital pastor, was preaching that weekend. And we thought, OK, for two weeks, we'll be kind of doing this just online, you know, remember, remember back days. in the day. Oh, back yeah, yeah, so, right. um, but, and so I was up in Atlanta visiting my youngest uh, daughter, Jill. So uh, obviously I'd been in touch with the team and I even stopped on the roadside and in a, in a Starbucks parking lot, <laughs> I, I recorded a video for the congregation and sent it to the team for something. But uh, when I got back in town Monday afternoon, uh, I didn't go home. I, I just pulled straight into the church, right into uh, one of our executive director meetings. And I sat down at the table. And for the next hour, each executive director told me how their teams had met, what their plan mm -hmm. now was, what their strategy was, how they were adapting and pivoting. Yeah. Mm. And I didn't crack the whip on any of that. <laughs> I, I didn't like say, here's what we're going to do. You, you weren't know. even in town. I wasn't even in town. Right. Yeah. And they, the team did all of that. That's great. You know, and, and so it is team, team, team. Now, as you said, what you do in days of peace will serve you well in days of crisis. Obviously, you know, you have to create a trusted team culture mm -hmm. that then when a moment like that hits, they can respond in that way. Yeah. Rather than scurrying around like a bunch of chickens with their heads cut <laughs> off going, oh, leader, leader, what shall we do? And, and here's another piece I would say, because I think a lot of our viewers and listeners might discount Bay Hope and Grace because they say, well, y'all are a big yeah, church. Yeah, you have all you got the staff. Budgets, you have all these, you got staff, yeah, you got absolutely. all sorts of stuff. But what I want to remind our friends is that uh, we have one big campus mm -hmm. and then three, two medium-sized campuses, and we have one small campus, a new campus that started with zero people mm -hmm. in Sarasota. And so at the other three campuses of Grace Church that live by the same principles that we do at the larger campus in Cape Coral, uh, that has significantly more resources mm -hmm. of people and money, sure. at those other small campuses, they're building the same kinds of high trust, high capacity teams with primarily volunteers. Right. So this this culture of being able to innovate, whether the 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 uh, positional leaders mm -hmm. in the room or not, right. is not about the size of your church. Yeah, 
It's, it's about the practices, regardless of the size of your church. So as Rick Warren famously said years ago, you can be big and strong or big and wimpy. You can be small mm -hmm. and strong or mm -hmm. small and wimpy. It's all about the culture that's been created. Right. And we would suggest it's a culture that resists heroic solo leadership, mm -hmm. which gets translated into what does the pastor say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. To uh, a culture of generative teams mm -hmm. that work on adaptive problems. Adaptive problems are problems that we don't have the solution to, like how do we do worship completely online in a digital format? How do yeah. we do that? What yeah. does that look like? Uh, in, in fact, you know, talking about being uh, smaller or under resourced, uh, you and I have been in, in Africa on multiple occasions mm -hmm. now, and you may have heard there's an old African proverb that says, if you think you're too small to make a difference, just spend the night with a mosquito. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and, and so uh, do, do not ever discount yourself or make an excuse right. that you're too small or under-resourced. Uh, that's, in fact, where a lot of the innovation and, and creativity yeah. can happen. In fact, I had a pastor friend share with me years ago who was in a large church, and he felt that whenever there needed to be you know, kind of a quick change or an adaptation. He felt like in a church of that size and complexity, uh, he needed tugboats to come alongside and move the barge kind of yeah. like this. But he said, oh man, I remember when I was in a smaller church or an upstart mm -hmm. church, man, it was like a speedboat we could turn on a dime. Yeah, that's good. So there's some advantage to that mm -hmm. and, and you might as well take advantage of that. Yeah, I, I can imagine, you know, the small church leader as they're listening to this saying, you know, I see the need. I'm in full agreement with you, but in a way, like, where do I start? You know, how do I how do I get started on this process of of uh, generating these teams that are leading together, that are growing together? Well, whether it's a team of volunteers or staff or mixed, you know, how, what's kind of the first step to kind of to, to reaching mm -hmm. out and developing those relationships and connections with people in their church if they if they haven't prior uh, done that with prior work? Yeah, right. Mr. Wesley, uh, Mr. <laughs> John Wesley might help us here, in the sense that. Um, Part of, the, uh, part of the standard operating procedure of the early Methodist revival movement was that when Mr. Wesley was preaching uh, on, a, uh, on a hill or at the city center, uh, his, his agents, if you will, his folks, had their back to him and they were wandering through the crowd to see who had their eyes lit ablaze or mm. lit on fire. Very good. And I think the wise woman or man who's leading a local church that wants to build Mm -hmm. a, a, a team that can do adaptive work, uh, a generative team that can do adaptive work, generative means multiplying team, is that uh, he or she is looking for mm -hmm. the people who have their eyes lit ablaze. Yeah. So I have a friend of mine who's one of our Timothys uh, at Grace Church who went to pastor an inner city church in a large southern uh, southern uh, 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 southern uh, city, city yeah. a giant giant southern city, and he he said. Um, at his little church that had mm -hmm. 60 people in it and 80 years of straight decline, mm -hmm. that the two people that had their eyes lit on fire were two 80-year-old hmm. grandmothers. Wow. And they became his partners in starting a new soccer team mm -hmm. that reached the urban multicultural community that they were in mm -hmm. and this exclusively white 70 and 80-year-old church. And after three mm -hmm. years of doing some work together, mm. they saw the first growth in that church in 90 years. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. I hear two things in that. Number one, I hear that there's, and, and you would probably even say this now in your leadership, there's always a tension that you're, that you're living in, mm -hmm. you know, that maybe you have a group of people that's on board with you and, and, and tracking with you. And mm -hmm. there, might not, there might be a group that's not tracking you and they might not ever track with you. Mm -hmm. Maybe one right. day they're gonna move on from, from your church. Uh, even if they're holding leadership positions now, it doesn't keep uh, a small church pastor from making a difference in, in trying to form those teams mm -hmm. when and where they can. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and maybe it's on the outreach. If, it, if they can't fix, you know, quote unquote, fix the council right mm -hmm. now, they can definitely work on the outreach of what their church yeah, is doing you, in the mission. Yeah, you find <laughs> your hot folks. You yeah. find the people with, with eyes ablaze. And, and the other people, you know, pastors, we refer to them as the back to Egypt committees, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because you're never going to get everyone on board with yeah. change. You know, the only person who likes change is a wet baby. So, uh, it, it, <laughs> right. you know, it doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you ask about one of the, the, the best first things and tools to use. 
And that's communicate, communicate, yeah. communicate, yeah. and then over communicate. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, just two weeks ago, we did a little kind of survey around here among the staff. Uh, at the end of, the st uh, of a staff meeting, I just asked, hey, I'd love for you to email me. Feel free to share anything. You know, that during this crisis, because mm -hmm. it had been about, about, what, four months now, I said, during this crisis, share with me, uh, where have you experienced uh, leadership that's been helpful to you? And, you know, where uh, have you been saying like, hey, you know, th this is not working or, or uh, I need help here. In other words, red lights, green lights, yellow lights. Yeah. And so uh, I got a, a good response from that and everything could be tracked to communication. Mm. What, I, what I was hearing from some folks uh, was, and I, I'm just so glad that this was clear and that this pathway was outlined and that you know, we were encouraged to stay in communication with mm. our teams and volunteer, okay. Well, on the converse side, every single sort of yellow light or red light I mm. heard about our leadership mm -hmm. over the past four months had to do with, well, I, I, I don't, this wasn't clear, or I didn't mm. really understand what that objective was, mm. or, you know, we could have heard more about this and we would have understood it better. Gotcha. And here's the irony. On everything where a staff member shared about, well, we needed to hear more about this, or we felt a little bit in the dark about this, I thought that we communicated <laughs> till I was blue in the face right, about it. Right. And so, you know, that's where we have to realize and get out of our own heads that you can't ever over communicate, mm -hmm. especially not in a crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. And I, I'd add a soft side uh, dynamic to leading teams mm -hmm. during t uh, times of crisis. Is it, and it's a soft side principle um, that I think is, is true. And Ron Heifetz captured it best when he said, it's not change that people yeah. fear, it's loss mm -hmm. that people fear. And so, you know, like during these days of living in uh, primarily a digital ministry universe, yeah. um, we have to recognize that uh, people are often mm -hmm. making decisions in their life based on loss, mm -hmm. of what they've lost. And, and so I think that helps us attitudinally mm -hmm. as we as teams navigate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Well, I, I would simply add, because I... You know, I teach this little thing about, uh, you know, how, how you lead teams and it's a around, I think, seven different Ds, mm -hmm. as you figured out, that's kind of my, my style. <laughs> well, <stick. laughs> you know, uh, the, the first thing, and this is obviously, you know, not all original to me, but the first thing is define reality. Mm -hmm. And automatically you develop credibility with teams and people if you're able to not whitewash or be in denial or sort of wear rose-colored glasses, but to simply define reality as it is, mm -hmm. but to very quickly follow that up with a second D, and that is declare hope. Mm, that's good. I find that, that some leaders are very good at defining reality and getting right. you really depressed mm -hmm. or maybe angry or mad, but they can't make that gear shift to then declaring hope in the face of that. Mm -hmm. That's good before the third D, which is develop a team mm -hmm. uh, to address all that. Yeah. And, and I think that as a leader, everybody is looking to you to put the stake in the ground saying, mm -hmm. yep, this is the reality. This is either the pandemic reality we're dealing with, <laughs> this is the systemic racism reality we're dealing with, you know, mm -hmm. this is the resource challenge we're living with, this is it, but there's hope. Yeah. You know, now how do we as a team address this? Mm -hmm. Now, as, as you know, and others who might have been, you know, watching the past four to five weeks of, of worship for Bay Hope, we've been in a seven week series called Pray at Your Own Risk. Mm -hmm. And we've been looking at these key prayers throughout scripture. And each one of them are remarkably similar in their blueprint, their template. Mm -hmm. In fact, the mm -hmm. last two weeks, one was Hezekiah's prayer for rescue, and this last week was Jehoshaphat's prayer for rescue about right. all the warring troops that had come against them and, and their kingdoms in Judah. And if you, if you parse out, if you do the expository work on the scriptures, you'll notice the exact same 
steps. And they were the same steps for David's prayers mm -hmm. as well. And the very first step was always admit reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge, you know, the condition on the ground mm -hmm. before you then move to the other steps. And I think that's, you know, primarily where leaders have to operate uh, because this is my Achilles tendon as a leader. Okay. Uh, I want to try and declare hope before Forward. I define reality. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm such a sanguine guy, optimistic guy. <laughs> I, I don't want anybody to ever like think anything's going bad. Yeah, sure. And, and that stunted me as a leader for my first years of ministry mm -hmm. until I realized that there is power and credibility and clarity mm -hmm. when you're able to name it and own it and define that reality. I, I'm a prophet of doom. I, I, right. I, I like <laughs> down the, I, defining reality is one of my gifts. That's great. Well, it's something that um, in, in terms of um, defining reality, it's something, George, you said with the pastor that was in, in the inner city, mm -hmm. that they were at that soccer ministry for three years. Yes. And I think sometimes defining reality in different contexts, whether it's a large church, a medium-sized church, a small church, wherever we're leading mm -hmm. or grow, or wherever God's given us to lead or to influence, that, hey, it's not all going to change overnight, yeah. you know? Or you can go plan a church, but then you got to, you know, figure out mm -hmm. fundraising and getting yeah. people in the door to, to begin with. So that's mm -hmm. not always yeah, everything it's made out to be either, so, yeah. 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 I, I have a friend, uh, we have a friend that's just uh, co-authored a book, uh, uh, Michael Beck, has just co-authored mm -hmm. a book with Len Sweet, uh, and they let me read a, a, a draft of it uh, and write an endorsement for it. It's called uh, Contextual Intelligence, okay. and it's CQ. And, uh, uh, and, and in leadership, particularly during times of crisis, CQ is so essential. Mm -hmm. it's, it's this defining reality piece. And, and so Nehemiah walks around the walls before he gathers the team mm -hmm. and announces the vision. So Paul, Acts 17, gets to Athens and realizes, I'm not in Jerusalem anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure. This is not the land of synagogues. This is the land of, of Greek philosophers. Mm -hmm. And so he, he, sa he says, as I walked around, I noticed. That's good. It was, it's a kind of contextual intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's the kind of work that teams have to do in these days, mm -hmm. is what is it, you know, do we understand the context? Are we Issacharians? Remember the right. Issacharians mm -hmm. from Chronicles? They, are the, they were the tribe that understood the times mm -hmm. and then knew what to do. Mm -hmm. They understood the times. And I think it's, that's a counterintuitive work of leaders. Leaders want to get to strategy, but right in front of strategy is context. Yeah. You know, what, what, what's our challenges? What are our assets? What is it that we, you know, what can we do? So we don't have all of the wonderful gadgetry of Bay mm -hmm. Hope. What can we do? Mm -hmm. What, right. what can we do? Mm -hmm. yeah. What are our assets during a digital online ministry? What are our assets? Oh, well, you know, we can open a Facebook page. Okay, that's, that's <laughs> right. It's a Good simple asset. We, yeah. we've, we got one iPhone, okay? Yeah. We can go buy a $22 stand and plug it in and we mm -hmm. can do church. Yeah. We can do church. We, there might be 20 of us, but we can do church. Yeah. Sure. And sure. Total shameless plug for the Hope Network, but yeah. one of our, right. one of our, uh, when we talked about online ministry with uh, our digital pastor Andy Mage, we 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 actually came up with levels, and we said, if you're level one, if you're if you're holding up your iPhone and playing it, here's maybe the next step for you. Yeah. So yeah, there's a there's a lot of levels between that and and what you guys do at Grace and what we do here at Bay Hope, but there's always a next step that anybody mm -hmm. can take if they're if they're if they're willing to look for it and, yeah. and to take the time. Sure. Uh, to do the hard work to look for it. Um, well, listen, I want to ask you guys kind of one more question before we, before we wrap up here today. We could go on so many different uh, facets when it comes to leadership, but uh, I want to kind of ask you to to engage your prophetic voice a little bit. <laughs> and uh, as as we've talked about, we're always living in some kind of crisis. Mm -hmm. But as we come towards the end of 2020 and we look into 2021, um, what would you say to a pastor that's saying, okay, you know, I've kind of moved. Yeah, I had to learn how to survive in the spring and the summer. And, and I feel like maybe I've done that. And maybe they're even taking steps towards thriving a little bit in their ministry. Mm -hmm. But as they come into this next season of uh, ministry of church in America in 2020 and beyond, mm -hmm. what do they need to be looking out for? You know, what's mm -hmm. kind of the next things on the horizon that you would say, hey, you know, have this in the forefront of your mind and your heart, of, of your team, 
as you guys are planning ministry for mm -hmm. uh, the next uh, couple yeah. of years? Well, first I would say, take a deep breath. Mm. <laughs> Just take a deep breath and, and know that there's a lot of prognosticators out there mm -hmm. And a lot of us sitting in chairs like this who might think we know what the new normal is going to be. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. We have no Clueless. idea. The only new normal I know is I hate the term new normal. Like, exactly. I, I mean, that's a new normal for me, for sure. But yeah. if, if I can offer any actionable advice mm -hmm. in the midst of this, it's a, a word that we didn't coin here, but that we're using a lot here at Bay Hope called the new digital reality. Mm -hmm. And that's a synergy of the physical and digital reality of the way that you do ministry, church, reality. In fact, uh, a, a lot of the corporate culture had to come to some digital reality yes. about their business models and platforms even mm -hmm. before uh, COVID. Uh, but everything we're doing right now, we're looking through the lens of how does that physically and digitally create a synergy for the end user mm -hmm. to grow spiritually, be formed, to be a better disciple, to be a better parent to a child, uh, to be in recovery better, to be in grief more productively, everything we do ministry-wise, how is it digitally gonna synergize mm. in good. the future? Yeah. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Matthew. George? You know, I, I think, um, Remember that the context has changed dramatically, mm -hmm. but the mission hasn't. Mm. Uh, the mission of the church mm -hmm. is to make disciples. That, that's our mission. How can we make more and better mm -hmm. disciples of Jesus? Mm -hmm. That's our challenge. Our business, uh, don't tell our worship <laughs> leaders this, is not producing really meaningful even transcendent worship experiences. Mm -hmm. They are means to an end, mm -hmm. not an end in itself. Our chief end is to make disciples of Jesus. I'll use our denominational mission statement for the transformation of the world. It's a good one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's our mission statement. Right. It's that more lost people are found, mm -hmm. more found people are discipled, mm -hmm. more lonely people are enveloped in the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. More poor people are cared for. More mm -hmm. justice yes. rings out loudly through our land. More people are welcomed into the kingdom of God. Yeah. That's our business. Mm -hmm. It's not preserving buildings or mm -hmm. staff or budgets. Who knows yeah. what the future holds? <laughs> Who knows? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we might all be radically different three, four years from now in terms of size, scale, mm -hmm. scope, who knows? Sure. But the one yeah. thing that's constant is that we need to go make disciples. That's good. And you know what the secret sauce is to do that? Mm. Jesus taught it. He said in the upper room, just hours before his arrest and trial and crucifixion, he said, they will know you're my disciples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not because you produce great worship service. That's good. Not because you do great kids ministry. Mm -hmm. Not because you have great production value. Mm. They will know you're my disciples by your love. By your love. Mm. So the bottom line of all of this is how much more loving mm -hmm. will a crisis make the church yeah. mm -hmm. rather than how much more harsh. Mm -hmm. Because right now, there's a lot of potential for division. Mm -hmm. Yes. In fact, you at Grace Church call it the days of what? Disease, Disease and, and division. division. Mm. And that's the way a lot of our culture is. So what is the church's one great response to engage and then make disciples? Love, love, love. Amen, yeah. amen. And we have a Holy Spirit that's, that's right. empowering us for the work. Mm -hmm. We're not on our own, not on our own. in this endeavor. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, I think that's a great place to stop. And I just want to express my appreciation to both of you for sharing your wisdom and insight here with us today. And I hope that for everyone that's watching and listening, that this has been a great experience for you as you've learned to grow your leadership in times of crisis, both as you've uh, learned how to lead yourself in a better and new and different ways and new paradigms, but also as you lead your church or organization or whatever sphere of influence uh, God has placed you in. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. And again, thank you for our presenters and have a wonderful rest of your day.